Good morning, everybody. It's nice to see so many people here so early. Um, so uh, I actually really like this topic because, I don't know, can you hear me? Yeah, because I'm really interested in primary, in primary care um, for women. So I was excited when Jan asked me to speak about this. Again, I have no disclosures. And my objectives today are just to review current practice guidelines on GYN wellness care and in general wellness care overall, and to kind of help you think about the importance of developing individual plans based on patient-specific needs and the expertise and experience of the physician. So when, you, when we think about wellness care, um, it really depends on who you ask whether women need annual GYN exams or not. So I thought it might be best to start off with this patient interaction that I had, uh, because it kind of summarizes so many of the questions that are involved in uh, this kind of vague, kind of iffy topic that there aren't sometimes clear rules or regulations about. So I don't know how many of you practice with an electronic medical record, but in my system, EPIC can sometimes be wonderful, but also the bane of my existence, because I get all these in-basket email messages from patients, and it sometimes takes me forever to go through them. But this is one that I got, and the patient says, I just had my annual exam with Dr. Smith. All is fine. I don't have any new issues. I've scheduled a regular mammogram for next week, and I wanted to check in with you to see if I need to see you on an annual basis. My last visit with you was um, November of 2016. And this is an actual patient note, and I asked her if I could use it, and she was very happy to know that she was gonna be part of this conference. So, <laughs> so a little bit of background about this patient. So at Duke, there's this primary care program called Executive Health or Signature Care. And it's basically a concierge program for primary care. And patients pay about 2,000 bucks a year, and they can get 24-hour, 24-7 access to their physician. They can get same-day appointments, and they get 30 to 45-minute visits with the physician because the physician templates are capped. And nobody has more than a couple of hundred patients in their template. So, um, I, it took me time because I had to go back and look up this patient's record. I realized that she had a pap smear a year ago and was scheduled for a mammogram. She had a history of fibroids and had a recent ultrasound. They were stable. She's postmenopausal. She didn't have any bleeding. Um, and her only complaint the year before was vaginal dryness, and she was happy using over the counter lubricants. So I wrote her back this note, and I said, I looked through your chart. If you're not bothered by any problems, I think it's fine to skip a year. Um, and if anything comes up, I'm happy to see you. So this is the message she sent me back, and this is the one that I want to focus on because I think it brings up a lot of the topics that I'm going to talk about. She says, I'll see you back again unless something comes up. From my perspective, I've had such a good patient-doctor relationship and opportunities for communication that I don't think I need to see primary care in OBGYN at my age. I will say, though, that before coming to Duke, I often used my gynecologist for my primary care needs. This is the paragraph I think that's interesting, too, because she goes on to say that regarding this communication issue, I have this father who's having multiple health issues, and he lives in rural, rural Illinois, and he and we often feel like he is not well informed by his doctors um, about the procedures and tests that he gets. This is just my perspective. And she's very grateful that she has terrific doctors and the opportunity to communicate directly. So the issues with this are she has the, issue, she has the opportunity to communicate directly because she pays extra for it. And I really believe that this is how everybody should be treated and, more importantly, how all primary care physicians should be compensated. Um, so the idea is communication, an integrated system where I had the ability to go back and look at her record and see what she had done with her primary care doctor and see what I needed. From my perspective, I work in a closed system. So I didn't get paid to go back and look at her chart and review it. But, um, but it took me time. So how does, how does that factor into everything? So with that in mind, um, I'll start my talk with some questions. So 
I put this picture here of uh, Healthy People 2020 from the US Department of Health because I think it helps us figure out, or it's supposed to help us figure out, what does it mean to be asymptomatic? Is an annual GYN exam really a well woman exam, or is it just a pelvic exam? And who are the people who actually provide GYN care, and are they wellness providers? Are they gynecologists? How do we judge and measure how well they perform? And behind all of this is this idea that medicine is big business today. And, and how do you kind of integrate uh, all of these goals with, um, with compensation? And we have very laudable guidelines, but in our current medical system, our economic compensation mechanisms sometimes don't match up with what we're trying to do, in my opinion. So, these are the mission, vision, and goals of Healthy People 2020. And if anybody looks at these, you would say, oh, this is wonderful. We want a society where all people live healthy, long lives. Um, the overarching goals, I think, are important. To attain high quality, longer lives, pre of, free of preventable diseases and disability and premature death. To achieve health equality and eliminate disparities and create social and physical environments that promote health. Um, we want to promote quality of life. Everybody would agree that these are important. Mm -hmm. And so we have these systems, especially from the top down, that actually have ways to measure these goals. And the overarching health goals are along this side. And then the foundation measures or categories are in the middle, and how they measure them are on the other side. So this is a very convoluted system that actually is trying to help us figure out what we're going to do. I put these up here because these are part of the, um, the health measures that went into the Affordable Care Act's um, decision to pay for preventive health. So where does women's health fit into this? My monitor is off again. Um, oh, well, there we go. So women's health fits in in this way. The Health Resources and Services Administration, which is um, part of the federal government, convened an advisory panel, um, which is this Women's Preventive Services Initiative. The women's this, this panel was, um, was comprised of um, gynecologists from the American College of OBGYN, family practitioners, the American College of, uh, or the American College of Physicians, and um, the National um, Nurse Practitioner Group. And they were um, charged with bring, uh, bringing up some guidelines f for how we're going to, how we're going to uh, pay for care. And so each of the different organizations has their own set of what they think annual wellness care should be. Um, and I've written those there. The conclusion of this study was that a well woman preventive visit is a clinical encounter that addresses issues of general wellness and provides screening, immunizations, counseling, and preventive services for a variety of health conditions. These visits also serve to facilitate access to healthcare services, Interestingly, few studies have been done to determine the effectiveness of improving health outcomes, although the effectiveness of many services that would be delivered in this setting is supported. And I think this is an important point, because everybody would agree that performing pap smears is useful and helpful in preventing cervical cancer, or that women should be informed of how often and when they should get a screening mammogram, and that teenagers should have STD counseling. But if you're going to package all those things together in a wellness visit, um, nobody has really studied the visit itself, just the individual components. So from a gynecologic perspective, where does um, an annual exam come from? And the idea of annual exam works back to my friend, Giorgios Pampanicolo, who I, um, who I talked about yesterday. And 
The reason for this is back in the 1940s when the idea of pap smear screening was being developed, um, the test wasn't such a great test. Um, then you were scraping the cervix, putting the si slides on a slide, and um, spraying with hairspray. Um, and there are probably people in the room who remember doing that. Um, yeah. So that test had a lot of false um, negatives. So that's why you had to do it more often. So in order to kind of get the most bang for your buck for screening, because you had to screen every year. So from the perspective of a screening test, it wasn't that great because you had to do it every year, but it really has made a huge um, difference in cervical cancer. Um, so annual exam came from pap smears and also from birth control. So in the 1940s and 50s, that's when um, oral contraceptives came into being. And so people needed to get their birth control prescriptions refilled. You had to check blood pressures. So um, they had to come back every year. So we're rocking along, doing OK. And then in 2014, the American College um, of Physicians publishes this paper. And it was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. And the title of the paper was Screening Pelvic Exams in Adult Women, a Clinical Practice Guideline from the American College of Physicians. So again, this is pelvic, this is pelvic exams. This is an annual wellness exams. But from a gynecologic perspective, the pelvic exam is essential to our visit. So this paper looked at the accuracy, the benefits, and the harms of the pelvic exam. And it was a big, um, a big review, um, a systemic review. And what they found was that they, they're, at the end of the day, they recommended against routine screening pelvic exams in asymptomatic non-pregnant adult women. They said that there was strong, this was a strong recommendation based on moderate quality evidence. So basically, useless exam. So I'm going to look at each of those individual components in, uh, according to this study. So we're going to start with the accuracy of the pel screening pelvic exam. In the studies that they looked at, there actually weren't any that looked at asymptomatic PID, gynecologic cancers other than cervical and ovarian cancer, and there were actually no studies looking at the screening pelvic exam for benign conditions. The only thing that they could base their uh, recommendations on, because this was the only data available, were three cohort studies of ovarian cancer and one um, prospective observational study about the benefit of screening pelvic exams on bacterial vaginosis. So in terms of benefits, because we were accuracy benefits and harms, there was only one study of ovarian cancer where they could evaluate morbidity and mortality rates um, of this exam. There was no studies, there were no studies to, in, um, to study indirect benefits. And there were no studies that explicitly evaluated the effect on non-ovarian cancer or non-cervical cancer morbidity and mortality rates, meaning like vaginal cancers or vulvar cancers. And I think even more importantly, these very common conditions, PID, bacterial vaginosis, and other benign conditions, they had no kind of good data to address those. So, in terms of harms, they wanted to look at exam-related harms, fear, anxiety, dis um, embarrassment, pain. And from that perspective, there were 14 surveys and one cohort study, all of very low quality. In terms of procedure-related harms, kind of false reassurance or overdiagnosis, overtreatment, too many surgeries, there were no studies. And they used indirect evidence from ovarian cancer screening. And that, that we all know that ovarian cancer is a terrible cancer because there's no good screening test. And when you um, look at that data and kind of take it back to procedure-related harms, 1.5% of the women screened had surgeries that they didn't need. 
They also looked at patient characteristics, and the ones that they were looking at were, are obese patients, do they have more harms than, than other patients? Do patients with sexual violence experience more um, adverse events? And there were 11 low-quality studies that looked at patient characteristics. So here's a busy but um, slide of the summary of, of all of those things. And, you can kind of see here that um, for diagnostic accuracy, bad studies and, but more importantly, absolutely no evidence. Um, also for indirect harms, same kind of thing. So really, really not good data. And with this very poor data, they make this recommendation that uh, against um, screening, pelvic exams in asymptomatic non-pregnant women. So when I started reading about this, I went back to this uh, person who I think as a, as a mentor, and his name is David Grimes. David Grimes is a, epi a GYN epidemiologist, and um, I really respect his opinion. And these are some things that I think are the limitations of this study, and in general, a lot of gynecologic um, overall screening literature. And the question is, should we change care for millions of women based on a method methodologically flawed study? And David Grimes wrote this article in one of the OBGYN journals, and he says, in recent decades, the computer science concept of GIGO, garbage in, garbage out, has somehow come to mean garbage in, gospel out. When computer software tackles a large database, many accept the computerized output as trustworthy regardless of the quality of the input. Sadly, no fancy statistical machination can compensate for poor quality data. So I think my personal um, opinion is that the American College of Physicians had a very good um, idea and it made sense but the study itself was very limited, and I'm not sure if I would have recommended the same conclusion. So let's look what the, at what the American College of OBGYN says about screening pelvic exams. So I put this here because um, ACOG also has a vision mission statement, and I like mission statements, and I think they're important, especially if you work from organizations that have to go from the top down. I put it here because this mission statement says that this is an organization dedicated to the advancements of women's health and the professional and socioeconomic interests of its members. So I think we can't forget that this organization is also, also cares about the socioeconomic um, impact on its members. ACOG has extensive um, guidelines on women's health. So, this purple manual is a 900-page book on guidelines for women's health, and there's a whole chapter on wellness care in it. Um, on the other side of this slide, I, will, I put up this little schematic because according to ACOG, the, wellness, the well woman exam isn't just a pelvic exam. It should include all of these things like birth control, cancer screening, other health screenings, colon cancer screening, depression screening, screening for sexually transmitted diseases, sec uh, violence in the home, and on and on. So from a macro perspective, I think um, the goals, again, are very laudable. What do they say about the, the screening pelvic exam? Specifically, ACOG defines what they mean by a pelvic exam. And they say it's an external exam, it's a speculum exam, and it's a bimanual exam. They also say that all women should have a periodic pelvic exams, and they should start about at age 21. Start at 21 because that's the current guideline for the initiation of pap smear screening. What that, what that correlates into is 44 million pelvic exams in the United States in 2012. That's a lot of exams. So, there's a specific practice bulletin, or committee opinion, on well woman care. And ACOG says that an annual visit should be, the first one should be age 13 to 15. 
So I would say that very few gynecologists start seeing their patients at age 13. Um, the reason that they picked this age is because they think this is a good way to introduce young women to the gynecologist. You don't necessarily have to do a pelvic exam, but you can talk about um, growing up, you can talk about getting your period, you can talk about um, sexuality. Um, I think most often this happens in the pediatrician's office. Or um, They recommend pelvic exam at age 21, um, clinical breast exam based on age and risk factors, and they introduce this idea of shared decision making. And I like the concept of shared decision making, and I think it should be integral in, in everybody's practice. It's the idea that physicians just don't dictate what happens, but you have a communication with your patient where they have, they're informed, they have information, and they can make a decision with you about their health care. So specifically, ACOG says, that um, they recommend this pelvic exam at age 21, but um, with limitations of the exam that are recognized. That it's a low sen it has a low sensitivity for detecting ovarian masses. It's not necessary to start OCPs anymore, and you don't need it to screen for sexually transmitted diseases. So their bottom line is no evidence supports or refutes the annual pelvic exam or speculum exam and by manual exam for the asymptomatic low-risk woman. So I'm getting back to these, um, these guidelines again because, um, interestingly, these guidelines, again, like I said, were used to um, help determine what the Affordable Care Act would pay for um, without a copay. And the top line up here, the wellness visit, um, for insurance coverage, uh, says that every adult woman should have a wellness visit. And how often do you need a wellness visit? This part right here I think is important because it says that some people may need more than one wellness visit. So you can essentially have your annual wellness visit with your primary care doctor paid for and see your gynecologist too. And it depends on the age and the risk factors of the patient. So the rest of the um, the rest of the characteristics here are the the um, the types of preventive services are things that already have um, benefit and have been proven and and we've talked about before. So ACOG's bottom line: the idea of a screening pelvic exam and an annual visit kind of seems logical. They recognize that it lacks data to support it, um, and they leave the decision on whether or not to do it every year to the patient and the health care provider through this concept of shared decision making. So I put this here mostly because I knew I was going to have an audience of primary care doctors. and. Um, this is an article that I found in the Wall Street Journal, I mean the New York Times. And this man, Dr. Emanuel, he's an oncologist and the vice provost of the University of Pennsylvania. So the title of his op-ed is, Skip Your Annual Pelvic Exam. And the opening line to his article says, We all make resolutions and promises to live healthier and better lives and to make the world a better place. Not having my annual physical is one of the small ways I can help reduce health care costs and save myself time, worry, and a worthless exam. So those are strong words. Um, so what does this very apparently very smart and well-positioned um, well physician base this on? Well. He based it on a 2012 Cochrane review um, of general health checks for reducing illness and um, morbidity and mortality. So I, I, say, I bring this up because not, um, it's evidence-based, it's a Cochrane review, 
But when you delve a little bit deeper into the actual specifics of the article, the article is a review of 14 studies, and nine of them are European studies. So European healthcare is very different than American healthcare. The three studies from the United States are from 1964 to 1980, before anybody was really practicing any kind of evidence-based medicine. So if you look at the chart, you can see that there really was no difference in the uh, morbidity and mortality with respect to cancer, heart disease, or overall mortality. But the, the conclusion of the study was the exams really didn't make a difference, but the people who went to their primary care doctors got more diagnoses. So I think you could say the same thing for annual wellness exams with your internist as you could for your screening pelvic exam with your gynecologist. So it brings me back to David Grimes's point of garbage in, garbage out. So what does the US Preventive Services Task Force say about screening pelvic exams? Well, I think these guys got it right. They said, wait a minute, we're going to give this an I recommendation. And an I recommendation means that there was insufficient data to, ass to, ac to assess the risks and benefits or harms, and that more information is needed. So here is their published study from periodic screening pelvic exams and the summary of the evidence. And another big busy slide, here's the difference between what the US Preventive Services Fa Task Force determined and what the other article determined. Um, right here, the, all of the data that they used to do this review and to look at is of fair and mostly poor quality. So although there are some studies, you have to look at what you, what the studies, how the studies were performed and how valid are the conclusions and what, what does it really mean? So the American Academy of Family Practice in 2017 confirmed the American College of Physicians um, statement that they do not recommend screening pelvic exams. So what we have is this JAMA article right here, screening pelvic exams, the emperor's new clothes now in three sizes. And I would say four sizes. Um, the Internal Medicine Organization, the OBGYN Organization, ACOG, the US Preventive Services Task Force, and the American Academy of Family Physicians. And George Sawaya basically says, wait a minute, guys. This is an important topic, and I think we should have some clarity. So. I think um, that Atul Gawande has a point, and I don't know if any of you have read this book. Um, it's called Better. One of my patients gave it to me, and it, there's a whole chapter in this book about the amazing success of obstetrical care in the modern world and how it's been the most impressive um, saver of mothers and babies and human life because of forceps because of um, the active management of labor and reduced maternal mortality from blood loss and infection. And he also states, though, that although these OBGYN physicians have had, in some, in some circles, people would think the greatest impact, they're also the worst at using evidence-based medicine to dictate practice. And there's another Cochrane review that looks at all different organizations, internists, surgeons, OBGYNs, pediatricians, and OBGYNs come in last in providing evidence-based medicine um, as a way to support what they do. So for a gynecologist, a screening pelvic exam is kind of like a chest aus auscultation to the cardiologist. We just do it because we've always done it. Um, the evidence may say, eh, maybe, maybe not. Um, interestingly, of all these articles and things that I've presented to you, only the American College of Physicians actually looked at cost. And 
So they determined that the total cost of preventive gynecologic exams and associated laboratory and radiologic services was $2.6 billion. I think this is a little misleading because in the radiologic costs are mammography. So they didn't break out mammogram versus pelvic exam. Um, and that's a little bit confusing. But the US Preventive Services Task Force and ACOG didn't take cost into account. And that first slide I showed you showed that there were like, I don't know, millions, 22 million pelvic exams performed in the United States. So I'm kind of getting to the end of the um, presentation part of my talk. Um, and I'll sum up a little bit to tell you what I think in terms of screening pelvic exams we should do and what we shouldn't do. What to do. Most importantly, read and interpret the literature carefully. Um, and remember David Grimes. Uh, I, rem I just like David Grimes because he stressed how important confidence intervals were. And if your confidence interval is really wide, what's the, va what's the real value of the study? We have to let look at that. And sometimes I think we just look at the headline of the article and we don't really delve much deeper. There's no um, substitute for good clinical judgment. And if you and your patient decide that this non-sexually active woman with no concerns and hypertension is here for her annual exam and she doesn't want a pelvic exam, she probably doesn't need an annual pelvic exam. I would also stress the idea of knowing your own skill level. There are many primary care providers who don't feel comfortable doing pelvic exams. Um, and they don't have the right equipment to do pelvic exams in their offices. Speculum com speculums come in various and sundry sizes, shapes, plastic, metal. And um, sometimes if you don't have the right equipment, you can um, cause more anxiety, trauma, pain um, to your patients. So if you don't feel comfortable doing the exam, it's OK to say no and refer to somebody else who does. What not to do? I would say don't assume that every woman needs an annual pelvic exam and a pap smear, because I don't think they do. I think if you work in a system where um, you can collaborate with your colleagues and you have a collegial relationship, you and your patient can decide what's best for them. Uh, and again, don't perform exams with inadequate training or um, equipment that you don't know how to use or um, apply. So in summary, I would say that annual GYN exams date back to the 1940s when cervical cancer screening and OCP therapy began. If we think about it, this was actually the beginning of preventive care. So OBGYNs were at the forefront of preventive care. <laughs> um, you need to make sure that you have evidence over habit. And I think this is where an OBGYN as a, as a whole specialty has in some ways been remiss. And um, the US Preventive Services Task Force really does come out and say, as does uh, the advisory committee, um, which included all those uh, organizations, that more data is needed on the benefits of annual, annual exams versus annual GYN exams. And in, in my institution, several years ago, the first line of my notes were, the patient comes in for an annual exam. Well, the compliance people came to me and said, uh-uh, you can't say that anymore. If you want a bill for a, a, for, an, for a wellness visit and get the RVUs that are associated with wellness care that have been put forth in the Affordable Care Act, you can't say annual visit anymore. You have to say wellness visit, even though the idea of wellness care is a little bit vague. Um, and at last, you need to remember to see the forest through the trees, and that sometimes things can be f confusing, but you have to do what, um, what you think is best. So I added here 
um, my questions, because I thought I would have a little bit um, more time. So let's take some questions. So wait a minute. All right, this is the first time I've done this, so I might need some help. So question number one. In the early 1900s, what was the number one cancer killer of women in the United States? Um, and everybody got the question. Um, I guess I give you time to answer the yes. question. Yes. Okay. So, you guys got it right. You learned something. Yay! <laughs> Cervical cancer. Okay, question two. The American College of OBGYN pelvic exam components include A is pap smear. B is examination of the external genitalia, rectovaginal exam. <coughs> and the correct answer is B. Um, the pap smear is in a, um, a component, and the rectovaginal exam actually is in a component. Yep. Okay, here's question three. In the clinical practice guidelines from the American College of Physicians, studies looking at which of the following conditions were included in the analysis. Ovarian cancer, asymptomatic PID, vulvar dermatosis, And the correct answer is A, only ovarian cancer studies. Those other things um, are important, but they basically weren't studied in relation to a screening pelvic exam. Here's question four. The US Preventive Services Task Force gave which grade of evidence to screening pelvic exams for the early detection and treatment of a range of gynecologic conditions in asymptomatic non-pregnant women. And the correct answer is D. They gave it an I recommendation. And here's the last question. Which organization took cost into account when making recommendations of performing routine pelvic examinations in asymptomatic, non-pregnant women? And you guys, most of you got it right. Um, it's the American College of Physicians. So that's the end of my slides, but um, I'd be happy to have a dialogue or take questions because I think this is a really important topic between um, gynecologists and primary care providers. Yes? exam on a woman who's not sexually active, even like say a nun who's never been sexually active, do you, when do you do that? So, or do you? In, in my practice, I personally believe that you can gain a lot of information from looking at the external genitalia and um, in terms of kind of skin conditions, anatomy. So. I, in somebody like that, I would recommend in my practice to have me look. They don't necessarily need a speculum exam, but I think looking at the external genitalia is important. And if, um, especially if the woman is older, so if she's like postmenopausal, 
Um, I think you can um, look for atrophy, skin conditions, even melanomas. Um, in my own practice, I had a patient come to me who had seen her dermatologist six months prior because she'd had a previous <coughs> history of a melanoma removed from some other part of her body. She was in her like late 60s. She had gone to her primary care doctor the week before she came to see me because she had postmenopausal bleeding. And it was easier to get the appointment with the primary care doctor than it was to see the gynecologist. So the primary care doctor didn't examine her. Um, he, he or she did a pelvic ultrasound and then sent her to me. And when I examined her, she had this huge black melanoma on her vulva. And so I would, I would encourage in that type of patient for you to not necessarily do a speculum exam, but just do an external exam. And again, it goes back to that um, idea of shared decision making um, to talk to the patient about what they would feel comfortable with. I can repeat the question too if you um, Your recommendations about the annual, is that independent of the Q3 PAP up to age 30 and the Q5 PAP from age 30 up? Is so the anal, uh, the rectovaginal exam? No, doing the PAP. Um, I don't understand your question. A liquid-based cytopathology examination of the cervix. Yes. So the, the current guidelines recommend pap smear screening for asymptomatic or people with well, um, with not abnormal pap smears every three years if you do it without the HPV subtyping or every five years if you do it with HPV subtyping. So if you have um, a normal person with a normal pap smear history, no abnormal paps, they need screening every three to five years for the pap. Right. So yes, these guidelines are different from the pap screening guidelines. So, and that's part of the problem with trying to determine what well woman care is and whether people should have annual visits because they do not need pap smears every year anymore. Right. Yeah. So my recommendation would be yes, recommendations outside of PAP guidelines. Okay. It just wasn't addressed in the talk, and I was it was it was kind of hard to. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, let's see. You repeatedly say about need more information. Is there any plans to have more information regarding wellness exams? So. From a national level, the American College of OBGYN is working on that. But yeah, it has to be done through research and studies, and you have to be funded. So, um, and it's a tricky thing because I work for an academic institution, and I have a plethora of data that I could kind of use to look at this. But in my life today, not so much 20 years ago when I started, but today it's really tricky and hard for me to do that because I'm not an RO1 researcher. I don't have any grants. And so even for academicians, my compensation is based on RVUs. And even when I have students in my place that, you know, you're supposed to teach, you're supposed to perform, and you're supposed to generate clinical dollars. So it's tricky. Well, the problem is all we have, it seems like a good idea, discuss with your patient, but you have no objective data to discuss with your patient. So exactly. how do you make a decision? So, exactly. It's very, very hard. Yeah. And so we go back to what, and, and I would say that we in gynecology are very, obstetrics and gynecology are very bad at this. We go back to what we always have been doing, and it may not be the best thing for the patient's habit. Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask, what have, you, what have we been doing? Is it just intuitive? Um, yeah, it's just intuitive. Like I said, uh, from, a, from a society perspective, uh, OBGYN society, we teach our residents, you know, or we taught our residents when I was being taught, that you do a pelvic exam on your patients every year. And you see them every year for uh, an annual visit. And I think this, the idea of the, the gentleman in the back who said the change in pap smear screening really did upend the way that gynecologists um, should see their practice. And from a national um, perspective, my former chairman is now the president of the American College of OBGYN. 
And he is very, very much pro-preventive, um, well-woman care. So he helped write a lot of those guidelines. And he is, he is promoting wellness visits and looking at age-specific components to wellness visits. So depending on the age of your patient, you know, if they're under 20, you look at immunizations, you look at violence, you look at STD screening. Um, if they're in the 25 to 30 year old range, you, you look at different components. So it's this idea that we as gynecologists no longer should be just doing pap smear screening and performing birth control. Now, I say in my own group of nine doctors, I think that we, in my little generalist division, practice very differently. There are some physicians who think that annual wellness visits, their only role should be to do a pelvic exam and talk about birth control. And if you have, um, and yeah, I'll look at your blood pressure, and if it's high, I'll send you to your internist. Um, but I'm not going to talk to you about osteoporosis screening. Go see your primary care doctor for that. Um, I'm not going to talk to you about um, sexual health. I'm going to send you to your sexual, the sex therapist for that. And I, I think that's wrong. Um, if you're going to, if we're going to say that we want to have a population that's healthy and well, um, we as gynecologists need to embrace that. I think in terms of kind of how you do that, the, the reason, I don't think those people in my practice are bad doctors. I think they're frustrated because they have 15 minutes to see this patient, and <laughs> in that 15 minutes, the nursing assistant has to get the vital signs, they have to review the medications, they gotta put them in a room, they have to change their clothes, and if you really do all this stuff, you will chronically be running at least an hour behind. <laughs> at least, yes. So. You know, we have these laudable goals, but putting those into practice, I think, honestly and truly, only works if you have a system that allows you enough time to actually spend with your patients. And in our, my Duke system, the people that have time to do that are the people in this concierge medicine practice. And so, um, you know, when we, we're talking, the, now, the, the, now the talk is all about population health. And in the, the future of medicine is going to be care for big populations of people. So it kind of reminds me back to the HMO era several years ago. And I think um, if we really do this population health model, it's, a, it's an opportunity to actually put our money where our mouth is and value primary care because I think uh, primary care physicians are grossly undercompensated. And it's, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes.